So we at ICLE have great admiration for this college, right? We're so much so that we're bringing our national conference here. And for those of you who want to come, it's nearly full, so you should sign up soon. Um, so many distinguished speakers, so many exciting topics today. Um, we were, I was really edified, gave, given a lot to contemplate by Dr. Topping's speech last night. Um, so I hope what I can share here is a kind of a framework and an overview that will serve more or less as a launching pad for many of, the, many of these other things we'll hear today, um, with other speakers going obviously more deeply into some of these topics. So for those of you who don't know the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education, that's I-C-L-E, not ISIL. ISIL is a terrorist organization in, in Iraq, OK? <laughs> So our mission is basically to promote the recovery of the Catholic intellectual tradition, K through 12, in Catholic schools, right? Um, I'm here with one of our co-founders, Dr. Andrew Seely. Is he here somewhere? There he is, Dr. Andrew Seely. Um, and our program manager, Megan Facero, a proud raven herself. Megan, where are you? <laughs> OK. Um, and also, as I said, so many member schools, um, sisters who have been in our credential program, many of our member schools here, so a lot of friends um, who I'm grateful to see. Uh, let's see. It was Dr. Seely who first had the inclination, just God put it on his heart, that teachers need to be nurtured, right? We need this ongoing spiritual and intellectual formation to actually do this job, this vocation to which we are called. And in 2007, he started what was called the Academic Retreat for Teachers, which is a beautiful program that we still have. So I would invite some of you to consider it. I think some people here have, um, have been to it. So I joined him a few years later in 2010 when I was um, teaching and involved with a fledgling startup school in upstate New York where my youngest son uh, attended. And I've basically come to this work through my vocation as a mother because what I saw immediately in that child was a whole different landscape of human formation, even though it was kind of a fledgling school and the wheels were coming off the bus, right? So even though it wasn't perfect, it was a startup school, it was such a deeply human education that he was responding to immediately. And that made me say, yeah, what was that about all the worksheets with his older brothers and what has gone wrong? So as a reporter, it just took me deeper and deeper into what's gone wrong with education. So long story, that's why I'm here, pretty passionate about it. And um, from there, uh, we launched our first national conference in 2013. 73 people showed up, and we were so thrilled to see that there was a movement across the country, people desiring this more deeply human education. Um, so over the years, our work has just skyrocketed. There's a real hunger out there for this renewal. In 2017, we started a member school program. We thought, oh, let's try this. And we had four schools that we invited. Today, we have 237 member schools all across the country and overseas, and that's growing all the time. What started as sort of in the homeschool movement and then independent schools broke through the diocesan level, and now it's really at the highest levels of the church. We have bishops and superintendents, including um, some here, who are seeking to grow in this, uh, in this direction, and it's just so hopeful. In fact, 63% of our member schools are now diocesan or, or parochial schools, so that's where all the growth is coming. Um, and many independent schools, including many of the Chesterton Academies, who are affiliated with us as well, because we share a similar mission. Um, so this is a grassroots movement that is now really in full flower. Um, we, as you can see on our website, I won't bother you with all the things that we do, you can see on our website all the events and formation programs, the, you know, we now have an alternative licensure program for teachers, which is very exciting. Sister, I have two sisters here. We have Sister Mary Alma, who was our valedictory speaker at our recent graduation of the Lex cohort. Um, and all you well-formed Benedictine students, we are these schools really need you, okay? So we have a website that has um, job postings all of the time, and they really are seeking people, young, well-formed people just like you. So all of these educators are really at the forefront 
of this renewal, and we are just privileged to serve them. It's very exciting because it's spilling over into family life and parish life as well. It strikes me that we're all seeking the same thing. We're just seeking to be instruments as Christ himself makes all things new. And the fruits are so abundant and hopeful. So I want to tell you about that, but first I want to set the stage with scripture. Where there is no vision, the people perish. This is a vision thing. So as Catholic educators from kindergarten through university um, grow in this way, they see that they have a crucial role to play in the healing and renewing that Christ is, is bringing to this disintegrating and parched culture. One beloved saint of our time communicated the utter necessity of Catholic schools with these words. The contemporary world urgently needs the service of educational institutions that uphold and teach that truth is that fundamental value without which freedom, justice, and human dignity are extinguished. In other words, if there is no truth, only power prevails. Pope Benedict XVI later described this as a dictatorship of relativism, and we see its grave consequences all around us today. We now find ourselves at a particular point in the history of the Christian West, right? Godless ideologies have had their long march through all of our institutions, through academia, media, government, and now big tech. I really don't know of another time in, in recent history when this vocation has been more crucial for souls and for society. Pope St. John Paul II also had wisdom to share on this vision thing. <clears throat> he said, Catholic education aims not only to communicate facts, but also to transmit a coherent, comprehensive vision of life in the conviction that the truths contained in that vision liberate students in the most profound meaning of human freedom. This is the freedom for human flourishing, not just human employment, right? It's the freedom to become what God made us to be, saints. Because the world is a different place through the eyes of faith. Facts can only be fully understood within this coherent vision. We need to know the author of creation in order to be truly wise and truly free. The future depends on regaining clarity about the nature of truth and the nature of freedom. But we know the good news. Truth is not an abstraction. Ultimately, truth is a person. St. Thomas Aquinas said that to know the truth is when our thoughts conform to reality. And we know that reality is both visible and invisible. So what is freedom then? We're going to define our terms. Until recent history, it was understood that true freedom is not license to do whatever we wish, but the freedom to see the truth of things and to order our lives and our loves to that truth. The fundamental error of modernity is a rejection and inversion of this authentic freedom, and it leads to misery. Our freedom is a gift and it was purchased at an enormous price, the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord. So what will we do with our freedom? How will we help children to use their freedom? Because of our fallen nature, the path to holiness does not come naturally to most of us. We must be educated for freedom, guided to freedom, formed for freedom, first by parents as the primary educators of their children, but also by teachers, mentors, priests, and religious. Catholic liberal learning is fully ordered to the truth that sets us free, and it's distinct from the secular educational project. <clears throat> we don't use the word liberal in the modern political context, of course. You can imagine how, this is not a sound bite. We've got an elderly donor who calls me three times a year and says, when are you gonna get that word out of your title? <laughs> And I say, no, we're reclaiming the word for its true meaning, right? Liberal comes from the Latin word that means free, liber, as in liberty. 
So the exploding number of schools we serve are reading these signs of the times, and they're seeking the antidote to this cultural crisis, the recovery of the church's intellectual tradition, which unites faith and reason. But this must begin from a child's earliest years. This is the aim of all Catholic education, right? It's not something other. But over the past century, we've been largely cut off from our own tradition. And we've been following the practices and philosophy of the secular model without really understanding the consequences. So let me show you one of them. This is a photo of 28 pages printed out to capture the 904 grades for one seventh grader in one academic year. <clears throat> in other words, this is a snapshot of an educational system that has lost the understanding of what education is for. This factory model seeks to measure and quantify everything to excess, right? And what does this cycle of cram, test, forget teach the young? That learning is simply for a grade not to grow in the understanding of the world God made and their place in it. Now, please don't misunderstand. We're not against assessment. Assessment is a key part of the learning process. It's that fixing and fastening process by which we retain knowledge. But it must be meaningful, and it must respect the dignity of the child. The demand for metrics and data has become the tail wagging the dog. Right? It's well-intentioned, right? We want to make sure no child is left behind. But it winds up doing exactly the opposite. Literacy and numeracy score scores have fallen since the advent of industrialized education. It's no accident that what year was the uh, Department of Education founded? <clears throat> 1979. I can show you charts that show literacy and numeracy decreasing after that become so process-based and so focused on the bits and bytes that we can measure that we've lost the big picture. We've lost that desire to know. Wonder, meaning, and purpose have been ejected from the classroom. So this is soul-crushing for the student, but it's also soul-crushing for teachers. In fact, it's driving teachers out, right? Last week, the Wall Street Journal had an article you must have seen about the exodus of fed up teachers who are just stepping out altogether. Now, I know this isn't happening at your schools, but unfortunately, this is happening at least at, at least one Catholic school that I know, highly regarded school, and they have excellent test scores. They have the best test scores in the state for Catholic schools because they're being trained to take tests. But these children do not love learning, and they're not forming habits of mind that will make them lifelong learners. So Catholic schools have not completely escaped this industrialized mode. We have systems, so we need data, right? <laughs> and where, do, where is the child in all of that? Um, <clears throat> just two quick stories about standardized tests or about, about education in general, right? <clears throat> when St. Jerome Academy, you've all heard of St. Jerome Academy, it was the first, um, first diocesan parochial school to move in this direction in 2010. There was a family there who had, in the neighborhood, who had homeschooled their children, and they wanted to send their oldest daughter, Anya, to St. Jerome. To do so, she had to take sort of a baseline standardized test for the Archdiocese of Washington. And they were like, oh boy, she's never done this before. She doesn't know what a standardized test is. Is she going to be able to follow the bubbles and the lines? <laughs> so they drop her off. She goes bounding out uh, into the school, into the school to take the test. They come to pick her up. And she comes, like, literally skipping out of the school with a smile on her face. And they said, Anya, how did it go? And she said, oh, it was so crazy. All the answers were on the test. from the mouths of babes, right? <laughs> another, quick, another quick story. Um, we have this, some of you here have been to our Spirit and Craft of Teaching program. It's kind of a one week intensive. Um, last year, I knew we had somebody there who, um, really wonderful woman. She had spent her career in public schools. She was Catholic. She had sent her, spent her career in public schools. She was rising up that ladder. She was destined to be the superintendent. She was a principal, destined to be the superintendent in her diocese, the Catholic, or no, the public school superintendent in her diocese. 
So I knew it was going to be a little bit edgy if I presented the edgy jargon generator. So you might be a little sensitive about this, but don't take out your phones and look at it now, please. But there's this website created by public school teachers who are just fed up with the jargon. And it's very, I won't do it here, but it's like you can press the button and it melds together all these prepositional phrases that are crazy. Let me give you one of them. We will synergize interactive multiple intelligence within a balanced literacy program. <laughs> so this woman, Christina, came up to me after and said, you're right. I write sentences just like that, and I don't know what they mean either, and I'm never going to do it again. <laughs> so here's the question. Where is the child in this language, right? Language matters. When we begin to talk about our vocation in the language of engineering, we begin to behave like these children are widgets, right? Nothing wrong with engineering, but this language is not appropriate for human formation. So where do we want to start? At ICLE, we do not begin with what is classical education or even liberal arts education. We begin, everything we do flows from what the church teaches us about education, about the nature of the human person, and the nature of reality. So I hope that you're familiar with this small little tome. Um, it, is, it was created by Archbishop Miller, whom we are blessed to have on our advisory board. And it should be no surprise to us that these five marks are achieved by the church's own tradition of liberal learning, which was designed for this purpose, right? Um, this document also calls for both content and methodology or pedagogy that is truly Catholic, but it doesn't ever define what does that mean. So I can say that we at ICLE spend all of our time thinking about what is content and pedagogy that is truly Catholic. And how do we offer educators the vision and the tools to bring this to life in their classroom? So I want to spend a minute here on these terms, you know, classical, liberal, all of this, because it's, you know, they're used interchangeably. So I want to give you um, our perspective on this. We like to say that classical speaks to the philosophical origins of the tradition. The Greeks, you know, they're, they're amazingly developed tools of reason. Catholic liberal education speaks to its end, which is freedom in Christ. Many of the schools we serve use the term, you know, the, the label classical, and that's fine. Um, you know, especially the early adopters. Various educators define cl classical differently, right? It would include the cultivation of wisdom and virtue, uh, spirit of inquiry, the use of the liberal arts, sometimes often the great books and a more modern interpretation of that, right? All these things are wonderful, right? And the handing on of, intentional handing on of culture. All of these things are wonderful. But it's important to remember the history here because the church took up the classical tradition, this excellent classical tradition from the ancients. Um, but reason alone does not lead to wisdom. Wisdom is one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? With the incarnation and the birth of the church, the classical tradition is taken up and transformed into the unity of faith and reason. And the church in the Middle Ages you know, further developed this, um, St. Thomas Aquinas especially. So the Catholic intellectual tradition includes all that can be gained from the admirable classical school movement, which we applaud, but it goes so much farther. We have the cardinal virtues, of course, but we also have the gift of the theological virtues and an understanding of grace. In Christ, we live and move and have our being. We can't unknow that or unsee that, right? It is a deeply logocentric vision of the world. So let's briefly consider content that is truly Catholic. Really, it has everything to do with context. Catholic education is inspired by a supernatural vision. Jesus Christ is the Logos in whom all things cohere. When the word became flesh and dwelt among us, it changed everything. We can't teach as though it never happened. Here's a wonderful quote from Pope Benedict XVI that summarizes this idea. Jesus Christ is the personified truth who attracts the world to himself. Every other truth 
is a fragment of the truth that he is and refers to him. Catholic education should immerse us in this mystery and point us toward the transcendent. And this is not reductionistic, as though we need to speak about Jesus in every math lesson. Please don't do that. <laughs> right? It's something deeper. It's the understanding that since all that exists is a form of revelation, all knowledge is a means of knowing God more deeply. He is speaking to us through all that is true and good and beautiful. And when we learn that 2 plus 2 is 4, we're beginning to grasp unchanging truths. 2 plus 2 is always 4, whether you're in Atchison or whether you're in Athens, whether it's Monday or Wednesday, right? So these, this growing understanding of reality. This life-giving vision is a cure to the skepticism and the cynicism of the modern world. It's an education for joyful hope. In a Catholic school, the books, the programs, the materials are not the curriculum. Not really, right? Curriculum means a course or a way, right? And we know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. So in a certain mysterious way, he is the curriculum. This, however, entirely depends on continually forming ourselves in this vision. It's not about the curriculum. It's about the teacher, the vision of the teacher, the understanding of the teacher. And we need to be intentional about cultivating this sacramental imagination in ourselves and in our students. What else is distinctive about a Catholic worldview? History. History is a coherent story centered on the incarnation, right? The great story, creation, fall, redemption, salvation. Unlike atheists, Christians believe that history had a beginning, it had a pivotal point in the incarnation, and it will have an end. And therefore, every day of the Christian life is a turning toward or a turning away from our Lord. We also want children to grasp the role of the church as the body of Christ in this drama in salvation history. We've lost our story as the pilgrim church on earth with all its triumphs and tribulations, right? Its achievements in science, art, mathematics, literature, architecture. What happened at the Melvian Bridge? What happened at the Battle of Lepanto? These are all our family stories and we must pass them on. Do we know our history as a people? Any anthropologist will tell you that no culture survives without passing on their story, their heritage. <clears throat> Education is enculturation. Social studies is a flatter landscape. It misses the dramatic tale of his story. So every lesson in a Catholic school is a seed that shows the truth of each small thing, whether it's a part of speech, a math equation, a battle in history that contributes to an understanding of reality as a whole. But a curriculum must be properly ordered to the age and development of the child. We see so many errors in modern curricula that do not attend to the development of the child. We can speak about that in the Q&A if you like. Um, and it also, it's not just what we teach, it's the way we teach. So what is pedagogy that is truly Catholic? Well. St. Thomas Aquinas noted that wonder is the first step that leads up the ladder to the beatific vision. A child's natural hunger to know is ultimately a hunger for God. We don't want to squash that wonder. Pedagogy comes from two Greek words that literally mean to lead a child. That's why the role of the teacher is so critical. The art of teaching in the light of Christ can be understood as leading the young from wonder to wisdom and finally to worship. Stratford Caldecott said that love is the beginning and end of education because love is how we become more human. Dr. Topping pointed out last night, the role of a teacher is to guide students to love that which is worth loving. Catholic school educators are not simply pushing facts and skills. They seek to cultivate what is human in the child, the ability to attend, and to contemplate, to use precise and eloquent language to communicate truth in a beautiful way, and to see God's patterns and order in the cosmos, 
to inquire ever more deeply about the nature and the purpose of things. And then, of course, central to our heritage and our historical tradition of education are the seven liberal arts. Now, I like to say that the liberal arts are not those dreaded college majors by which your children will graduate college without solid job prospects, right? <laughs> the seven liberal arts are actually tools of thinking and learning, of perceiving what is true, the liberating arts that free the mind in a highly ordered way, that train the mind. They're beautiful and worth studying each for their own sake, but they're also an integrated um, training for the mind that orders the soul, right? So the arts of language, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, you heard Dr. Talk, Dr. talk, being, talk about naming, you know, seeing and naming things in accord with their nature. And then of course the arts of number, arithmetic, geometry, music and astronomy or physics, perhaps. Notice, there's four arts of number. The liberal arts are not just about the great books. They are um, stem on steroids because, <laughs> because they show you an integrated understanding of God's language of number in the world, right? So when we separate and silo all these things, we can't see that integration. Um, State standards are one framework, and they are very recent in the history of education, right? The seven liberal arts are the superior framework with a proven track record. They represent 2,500 years of best practices in education. <laughs> Let me show you my data-driven results. <laughs> okay, there it is. What do these luminaries have in common? Now, not all these notables are Catholic, but they were formed by a liberal arts education that had been embraced and further developed by the church. Simply put, this works. Before the state controlled education, the Catholic church developed education, and it was the gold standard for centuries because it was a coherent, ordered pursuit of truth in all the disciplines, and it sought for wisdom and virtue. As you see, it produced some of the keenest minds and the holiest saints in the history of the world. And as I say, it did so without state standards, without standardized testing, and without a constant demand for metrics. Progressive education has a short and shaky history compared to this legacy, right? It's roughly 100 years old, and we can see what it has wrought. Now let me pause here. Do we know all those people? So you see this guy on the right with the beard and the mustache? And I say, I ask people, who is that? And people say, Michael Van Hecke? <laughs> like these are press. <laughs> Anybody know who that is? Louis Pasteur, right. I think we probably know the others. So anyway, so let's look at this from an historical perspective. <clears throat> Just briefly, as you see from that sort of smoky blue stripe across the middle, since ancient times, as I said, the, an education for freedom was seen as the cultivation of wisdom and virtue. <clears throat> and as Catholics, this has its deepest roots also in the writings and traditions of God's chosen people in the Old Testament. This is not just about reason. It's also about faith. Athens, it's no accident that our Lord is incarnated into a certain place and time in history, bringing together Athens and Jerusalem. Um, we can think that wisdom is to know the truth and virtue is to imitate the truth. Intellectual and moral virtue are always united. The progressive education of our time presents, represents a rupture with this long tradition that saw education as formation for human flourishing. And progressive thinkers educated, engineered a radical shift this, to this pragmatic, utilitarian philosophy of education that has undermined a belief in the transcend, transcendent and has taken the joy and wonder out of learning. Now I want to add here that not everything in secular education is bad, and so I am not complaining about teachers. I, I wanna say, given the context, we just wanna be very intentional and discerning about what we allow in from secular education. So for example, the science of, of, the science of reading, if you use that, that's very, that very much comports with how the mind works. So there's plenty of things out there that, has, that have gotten through, we just need to be able to dis discern and to be alert uh, about what we adopt. 
A Catholic education reveals our deepest identity as beloved sons and daughters of the Father. So consider what happens when God is systematically removed from the classroom. John Dewey is considered the prime architect of modern education, right? What many don't know, what you didn't learn in education school, is that John Dewey was a practical atheist. Let me share a quote attributed to him. <clears throat> we can discover no divine purpose or providence for the human species. While there's so much that we do not know, humans are responsible for what we are or will become. No deity will save us. We must save ourselves. Dewey did not understand the most fundamental truth about the human person made in the image and likeness of God and destined to be with him forever. This is a tragic error because his educational, his educational approach was founded on the wrong conception of the person. <clears throat> as as um, Dr. Topping pointed out last night, no educational system is neutral. So let's dig into that a little bit. The philosophy of secular education asserts that man is the center of reality, that truth is relative to man, and that knowledge of subjects or things, including man himself, is random, detached, and changing. In other words, life is chaos. You really can't count on anything from one day to another. Is it any wonder that so many young people have become skeptics or that they suffer from anxiety and depression? You can see that modern education itself is random, detached, and changing by every new fad that comes and goes, right? This is a source of great stress for teachers. The problem with this secular philosophy is that it is a lie, and much that flows from it is deeply flawed. This, isn't it ironic, though, that this philosophy that seeks to elevate man as the measure of all things winds up enslaving him? Think about those 904 grades. <clears throat> By contrast, the philosophy of Christian liberal arts education asserts that God is the center of reality, that truth is defined by God, and that the knowledge of subjects or things, including man himself, is unified, rational, and consistent. <clears throat> in other words, God has a plan. We can trust in it. We can trust in his design, in his mercy, and in his love. This understanding of the world gives us confidence and joy and hope. The world is hungering and thirsting for our Lord. He's the source of renewal, right? He's making all things new. <clears throat> we must be the disciples that can help this, bring this healing. Just one more comparison here. So modern education, because it is ordered to ma material temporal ends, winds up fragmented. It's fragmented, it's industrialized. It focuses on practical skills, the things you can measure, on bits and bytes of information. There's a rush to get through the material, so teachers are forced for the sprint, so we wind up, it winds up being one mile wide and an inch deep. We wind up telling, instead of in, engaging in more um, interactive uh, teaching methods because we're in a hurry to get the point across, um, and it's susceptible pol to politization and other ills because you can't see the big picture. Catholic liberal learning, by contrast, because it's ordered to eternal happiness, is about the integration of subjects, knowledge, and faith, of faith, life, and culture, right? It restores the meaning, purpose, and wonder to the classroom, and it cultivates habits of deep thinking. We need to slow down and think deeply. There's a lot of interaction, a lot of lively discussion, and therefore a lot of soft assessment going on constantly in these classes and it develops intellectual freedom. So the good news to report is there is this vibrant renewal going on in Catholic schools because we're returning to our roots, uniting faith and reason, and re rediscovering the liberal arts as a framework instead of a standards-based model. It's flourishing in all kinds of settings, rural, urban, rich, poor, large, small, right? This is a deeply human education. It's Catholic with a capital C, and it's Catholic with a small c. After five decades of plunging enrollment and waning belief, it seems that the solution to this crisis 
has been hiding in plain sight all along. And it's our tradition, right? Um, you can read about the stunning success of a lot of these schools, how they've um, you know, just completely turned around on our, on our website, the case studies, and also in our book, Renewing Catholic Schools. Um, these approaches are as powerful in, as in the 21st century as they were in the 16th century because human nature doesn't change and the nature of reality doesn't change. It's the fads that come and go. This is the antidote to all of those fads for teachers who are trying to keep up with the latest and the greatest and the newest thing. And it's different from everything out there at any price. So parents immediately see the difference as I did in my children and they are desiring it and many of them are driving this, um, this, uh, this desire. The goal is to illumine the mind in order to inflame the heart, right? There's nothing pragmatic or utilitarian or boring about the church's tradition of education. It sparks real joy in learning, and that's a hallmark of these schools, and a joy in teaching. There's nothing more motivating than love itself. So just a little data. People keep asking us for data. I keep saying, look at the children in front of you. Is that not enough data? But anyway, we did do a study of our schools to sort of prove to people that, hey, there's some data that will back this up. One of my favorites, 82% of school leaders report better faculty engagement and better faculty morale, right? This is, this is a return to the beauty of our vocation, to restore the nobility of teaching. Another favorite metric here, two-thirds of schools reported increased family engagement in the life of faith. This is spilling over into homes. 78% of these schools reported increased enrollment, some of it dramatic, doubling, tripling. 81% of schools reported test scores increased or remained the same when they stepped away from teaching to the test. <clears throat> it's spreading so much. You see, we have reached, like last year alone, we reached 335, 39 schools that represent 75,000 students, 8,200 educators, and 108 dioceses. So it is just, you can't hold it back, right? This is rich and true and beautiful, and um, it's just a privilege for all of us to be a part of this. So I just want to begin to wrap up with just a summary. I said a lot there. <clears throat> One thing to think of, this is not a model. We have to step away from thinking about models, right? We just grab the model, the curriculum. It is a philosophy and a theology to infuse, not merely a program to adopt. It's far upstream of any model or product. Um, we believe that the principle of subsidiarity applies. There's different charisms in the church, right? Many of our schools look different when you visit them. They're using different curricula, all of which comports with this underlying philosophy. But it's not cookie cutter. There's freedom within limits and guidelines. Um, you'd see rich content and engaging pedagogical practices in all of these schools. You don't even need, even need to call this anything other than the recovery of the Catholic intellectual tradition, right? It doesn't need to be a new brand. It really doesn't. It's about growing in the art of teaching in the light of Christ. <clears throat> Another moment. Dispelling the myths, okay? Is it elitist? You hear this all the time. You can ask these students at Holy Innocence School, one of our member schools in Long Beach, California, 73 quarters of those families are eligible for free and reduced lunch and half the parents don't speak English and they are overjoyed by this. So the question is why wouldn't every child deserve an education that immerses them in what is true and good and beautiful? So it is not elitist. Is it too rigorous for many students? Again, not at all. What students, parents, and teachers are discovering is that by restoring meaning and purpose to learning, we fuel that natural desire to learn. <clears throat> this approach follows this time-tested natural ladder of learning, and it also inherently, as I said, allows for a lot of differentiation in the classroom. One of the best things about it is that children who struggle really can come alive in this way. Is it backward-looking or closed-minded? No, we cannot know who we are in the modern world until, unless we know what came before. It's not narrowing, but broadening. It shows us what unites us as human beings, frees us to see the big picture. Is it outdated? No, we would say proven and enduring, right? It's the fads that come and go. 
Is it too focused on the humanities? No, I already showed you STEM on steroids, right? <laughs> will it prepare students for college and career? Of course it will. We see that children who are taught to think clearly and to make connections between things and to live virtuously are equipped to be a force for good in the world. So I want to wrap up here with two famous images that basically summarize everything that I just said. And I think you will recognize them. This shows the origin of the tradition of liberal arts education in the ancient world. It's called the School of Athens, right? By one of the three great masters of the high renaissance, Raphael. And it represents the ancient Greek search for truth, their love of wisdom. It wasn't an actual school, that sort of figurative, figurative representation there. In the center, you see two figures. You see Plato in the reddish tunic, and he's pointing to the forms, the ideas, right? This is where we seek truth. And he's debating with his student Aristotle, who's saying, who's pointing to this world, saying, no, we begin to know through our senses, right? Um, but what did they have to do with Catholic education? Ironically, it turns out that we have more in common with these ancient pagans than we do with modern educators. <laughs> Most of these thinkers believed that truth exists, that it can be known, and that it can be communicated. And they yearned to find the ordering principle of the universe, which they called the Logos, right? But they lived before the incarnation. They could not know that Jesus Christ is that Logos, right? So you'll see this image all over classical schools. But they don't tell you where it is. Some of you have seen this yourselves, right? This image, this fresco, is enormous, first of all. It's 25, more than 25 feet long, more than 16 feet high. It's in divine proportion. Um, it's in the heart of the apostolic palaces at the Vatican. As I said, it represents the search for truth. Now, on the short walls of either side of this rectangular room, you have Raphael's images of uh, goodness and beauty. So you have those three transcendentals. But it's the opposite wall that illumines all the others. Because if you follow the path of Plato and Aristotle, they are walking exactly toward this. Our Lord in the monstrance. So this wall shows a fourth transcendental, the one. Above the monstrance, you see from the top God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, surrounded by the company of saints. So what were Raphael and Pope Julius II, who commissioned him, saying by the frescoes in this room? that all our desires for truth and goodness and beauty are answered in Christ. So there is only one philosophy of Catholic education that underlies all the rest. And this is it. And it's beautifully illustrated in the Vatican itself, right? The unity of faith and reason that is depicted so beautifully here. Only an authentically Catholic school can take the classical liberal arts tradition to its natural fulfillment in our Eucharistic Lord, where heaven meets earth. Plato and Aristotle, this answers their debate, doesn't it? Is it here, is it here, right? Is both and. Because as we teach our students to attend and to contemplate and to behold, we are ultimately preparing them to behold the Lamb of God. And as scripture tells us, we are transformed by what we behold. This is the education for discipleship. And the students in these schools will not doubt the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist. It entirely depends on our ability to seek his grace and to be rooted in him every day in order to convey this vision and this grace. And it's a call for all of us personally to personal conversion of heart every single day. Because this is the vision of the God who is both Logos and love. So, if we could just close with a glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Do we have time for questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's not a mic. There's not. We're taking questions. I saw a hand. You mentioned that classical education is for all children, and I, I deeply believe that too. Um, however, in, this, in most classical schools that I have encountered, they, don't, they haven't found a way to really meet the child who does struggle. Mm -hmm. What is your vision and answer for that? Yes, so we at the Institute are really trying to work on those things, like how, so, so I mean, of course, super severe, um, super severe learning differences are going to need extra support. But there's a range in which this natural order and this sort of spiraling way to revisit and discuss is just, it's really about good pedagogy. If you look at special education and what's happening, it's really just very targeted, very good pedagogy. So as we recover all this pedagog this great pedagogy, we're seeing real differences. And so we just need to help equip teachers to understand that. In my experience, in my classroom, you know that sixth grade boy who's the class clown because he doesn't think he's a scholar? He completely turned around when we spent a long time on slavery and his heart began to burn on, on this, right? And he was able to go from being able to speak about it to write about it and to be driven. So, I mean, there's gonna be an area where there's gonna need extra support, but you'd be amazed by how rich content that drives learning. Let me just give an example about the multiple choice test. Haven't we all seen that confusing multiple choice test? And you know more about that, and you know there's a slight exception to that, and so you say no. When, when we get rid of, try to get rid of those, right? We, um, you know, if you're writing an answer, you can demonstrate a basic knowledge, but you could also wax philosophical and write a poem about that raindrop, <laughs> right? So there's this whole natural differentiation built into the way we assess. <clears throat> Anybody else? More questions? Diane, thank you for the presentation. I thought it was outstanding, and you really gave a good contrast between a secular and a Catholic education. I teach at a, a, a seniors at a Catholic high school, and I'm at the same time teaching the Summa Theologia and also the history of philosophy. And I know you mentioned some errant folks like John Dewey, and in teaching the history of philosophy, I am teaching folks like Kant and Hume and Nietzsche and Sartre, and I just wonder if you think that that's a good idea, and if so, when to teach the errant philosophers? Because sometimes some of these people, like Nietzsche, can be very appealing to young people. When you, you know, the, his humanism is quite appealing. So, just whether or not you think that that's a good idea to incorporate, even if one is trying to pick at the fallacies of their arguments, and if so, at what age you think that's appropriate? Thank you. Oh boy, I see somebody ba back in the room who has strong feelings on that, <laughs> Dr. Andrew Seely. Um, so I might ask him to also weigh in on this. I would say, I'm gonna talk about my own experience. <clears throat> when I was at Georgetown, it happened to be at a period when they were absolutely obsessed with Sartre <laughs> and Camus, and like how many copies of the plague do I need to have, right? A anyway. <laughs> The problem was that that was so isolated and in context. Augustine and Aquinas were completely out of fashion. So if you study the whole tradition and you see how they went awry and what was missing, and you have to be really grounded in the other. I, I know that a lot of people have hesitations about going too deeply into some of this. Andrew, maybe you could weigh in on this. Um, yeah, I guess I always uh, like to learn from the experience of those who are teaching and whether, they've been, whether they think they've been successful or not. But uh, as a rule, I think that getting into serious philosophy is um, more advanced than you're generally going to be able to do with high school students. And that uh, arousing, doing things to arouse philosophic wonder, to get them engaging in philosophical discussions, helping to build up the habits that are going to uh, make them actually philosophical seekers of wisdom, to people who want to deeply understand instead of just um, be able to sort of... Uh, I guess, provide ready answers to difficult questions. 
Uh, I think that that's really good to be doing with high school students, but I'm, I'm skeptical of what you can do on an abstract philosophical level with the high school level. So, and, and I think then that uh, um, it's good for you as a teacher, I think, to be talking with them about those ideas, but I don't know to what extent that's fostered by having them read those authors themselves. Two more questions. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Hello, thank you for being here. Um, is ICLE developing tools for the schools that are renewing for the uh, doubting parent? The doubting parent. What about the test scores, right? Yeah, we sometimes, so we, we often work with schools over three years to recover this tradition, and we include in that however many parent talks they want. So I give a lot of those, you know, some scaled down version of those to help them overcome this and understand that, I mean, modern, parent is modern parenting is driven by anxiety and like to just dial that down. So we do talks, we are talking about doing, you know, maybe a couple of webinars that you could just plug in, have the recording, let them um, sort of see that. We do have, and we probably need to reprint them, we also have some like brochures that kind of go through the top 10 reasons why you really want this for your child. So that's a reminder, Ava, that I should make sure we have those available to member schools and dioceses. Thank you so much for your talk. One of the things I really loved was how you said that the sciences and uh, humanities are not just to prepare the students for being in the world, but it's really about a relationship with Christ. Um, I teach a class of 24 seventh graders, and one of the things that I really want to do is to individualize that instruction, to say that this is for you. Like, this isn't, this isn't for something for you to do, this mm -hmm. to do, to like go to college or go to high school. Like, we're trying to prepare them for high school, but like all this, that this is for you. So how do I do that with multiple students at once? I wish I could just talk to each one, you know, and just explain this to each one, say, um, and see where they're struggling each way. I'm trying to do that kind of through assessments, but it's a struggle to reach every student. Mm -hmm. So how would you recommend making it a relationship for each student, mm -hmm. but also teaching the whole class? Mm -hmm. So that's a long answer that we can talk about over lunch, but I, I, I would just say generally that learning, in so it's both, right? But a classroom and a school is a community of persons, right? And so because there's so much learning going on together and they're benefiting from growing in this vision, they may be struggling and there needs to be something independent, but it's you and your individual relationship with them and having a sense of, of, of them and knowing where they can shine. And you know, in our like credential program, we go through this a lot. You know, how do you do that individualized instruction and make sure you're treating those children as an individual, just not a, you know, a gaggle of seventh graders. I love seventh grade, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so I'll talk to you more about that over lunch, maybe, okay? All right? Well, Fantastic, let's you. thank Thank Elizabeth you so Sullivan. Much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. A cup, stay right there. You gotta stay right there. We have the award presentation. But first, you mean it just hasn't a quick couple rebuffed? of quick announcements that rebuffed? upstairs we have the kids zone and the atrium. It's awesome. There's espresso, puppies. <laughs> People are gonna be shooting at balloons with staple guns. It's fantastic. <laughs> All of the colloquium sessions are up in the Feral Academic Center. So the answer when Dr. Mirachi asks, did Mulholland do his stairs today? Is yes, yeah. and every day. Because yeah. I moved to the flattest, other than Florida, state of the nation, to go up and down ladders all day. It's fantastic. Okay, I hope you noticed, 1979, Department of Education, also the year Tom Waits wrote Jersey Girl. <laughs> As educators, we know there are no coincidences there are just serendipitous, synergetic intersectionalities. Oh, that's so good. That is so away. good. Wow. That's the show right there. That's the show. Um, so as, what I was going to say was uh, after the, I kind of, you know, the, I was talking about 1979, the uncertainty of the decades following the Second Vatican Council, Pope John Paul II 
uh, called upon Catholic institutions to renewal within our tradition in order to engage modern man. And we are grateful for the work that Elizabeth and ICLE uh, have done in promoting the renewal of Catholic education. And so we recognize her as a Benedictine College St. John Paul II distinguished speaker. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and now we break for our colloquium sessions. We'll try to start as close on time as possible, but it'll probably be more like 9.50 that we'll start those. So head on up. Go for it. <laughs>